All right, AP Bio 2 Kids, it's Miss Lynam coming to you with the second to last video on transport. Remember, we're on uh, Unit 3, Cell Structure and Function, and today's lesson is going to be active transport. So we should be on slide 49, so you will find your notes. This is what it looks like. This is where we're starting. Okay, so a little bit of background just before I get into jumping into the, the material on the slide. Um, we've already talked about passive transport. And if you remember correctly, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, as well as osmosis, all three follow a concentration gradient and can occur in either direction. Okay, so basically they move high to low with a flow, but they can go into the cell or out of the cell, um, and it can be in or out of an organelle as well. The substance is transported, remember, high to low. Okay, in this case, we're going to be talking about active transport. We're transporting this time against the concentration gradient. So we're going to be going low to high. So let me see if I'm, I got a new Moby, so let's see if this bad boy works. I'll be thrilled if it does. Okay, so we're going to highlight against the concentration gradient, which means low to a high concentration. And this is going to require an output of energy. This is ATP. Remember, um, ATP is cellular energy. Our next unit, we're going to focus all on the production of ATP at the mighty mitochondria. But this process does require energy. The direction basically depends on the cell's needs. Okay, so this is always going to go from a low to a high against the concentration gradient and will require energy. Okay, so the first example I want to go over with you, this is one of the most important in animal cells. Okay, go ahead and write that down. This is animal cells. And this is the sodium potassium pump. Okay, these processes, active transport, are going to use carrier proteins as opposed to the channel proteins that were used in facilitated diffusion. Um, the carrier proteins are going to be ones that bind to specific ions and are going to pump them across the gradient. Now you might say, well, why are we pumping low to high? Some processes in our cell require our cell to have a steep gradient. I'm going to go ahead and write that over here. We require a steep gradient, which means opposite charges on one side to the other side in order for our cell to function appropriately. Okay, so the sodium potassium pump is one that, okay, ready? Watch this. Normally, on the extracellular fluid, which is outside the cell, normally the outside of the cell is high in sodium, but the inside of the cell, right over here, this is inside, is low in sodium. Okay, and the opposite is true of potassium. Normally the outside is low in potassium and the inside is high in potassium. So the way that this pump works, okay, first of all you're going to notice there is an energy need in picture two. You can see the ATP that's required. Sodium and potassium are both going to be pumped from a low to a high concentration using this carrier protein which you see is the purple molecule. Okay, well in the first picture, picture number one, you'll notice right here this is kind of like the active site. It is specifically designed, in this case, to fit sodium molecules. Okay, so when the shape is appropriate, sodium from the inside of the cell can come in and bind, and you will notice there are three, that's one, two, three sodiums, that can bind to that place on this carrier protein. So those come in, they have an affinity, and they're going to want to be pumped across the other side. Okay, in picture two, this is where the energy need comes in. When ATP comes in, I don't know if you remember from freshman year, we're going to talk about this next unit, but ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So there are really three phosphate groups that are bound to the adenine that is there, adenosine, the adenine, and the ribose. So these three phosphates, the energy is located in the bonds between the phosphate molecules. So when ATP comes in, one of the phosphates is broken off. Okay, it's hydrolyzed. As it's hydrolyzed, remember using water because it's hydrolysis, the phosphate binds to this carrier protein. You can see it's stuck right here. That's known as phosphorylation. Okay, phosphorylation. Whenever that phosphate molecule binds to that carrier protein. Well, what that does is that causes in picture three the sodium to come out, but you'll notice the shape of this binding site is now changed. Look at how small it is in picture three compared to picture one. So the phosphorylation of that ATP and the binding of the inorganic phosphate to the carrier protein changed the shape of the site where sodium would bind. But now look at the side over here at how big the right side is compared to here. 
Well, now that's an affinity site for potassium. Okay, so we pumped three sodiums from the inside of the cell, which was where the low concentration was, pumped it to the outside of the cell, the extracellular fluid, so it went from low to high, used ATP, the binding of the phosphate caused the release of the three sodiums, the shape changed, and now that shape on the right side is able to stick to potassium. So potassium now comes in, binds with that, okay, which is, oh, I'm skip my picture, it's actually over here going down, it's in picture four. Okay, so the potassium comes in, is now appropriately shaped for potassiums, but you notice how there's only two potassiums that are attaching, whereas over here there were three sodiums. That's going to be important in a second. I'm going to talk about that there's an electrochemical gradient that's created. Okay, so the potassiums come in, they bind. Now the phosphate is broken off, okay, it's cleaved off. That returns the original shape of the side that's now uh, has an affinity for sodium. So that causes the potassiums to come out. You can see right here. And now the shape goes back to where sodium can bind to it again. Okay, so there's something that happens, and I'm going to talk about the three versus two. If there are three positive charges that are pumped, you can notice that are pumped to the outside of the membrane, but there are only two positives that are coming into the inside of the membrane, that means you're going to have three pluses on this side to two pluses on this side. That creates an overall imbalance in charges. Okay, so in fact, the inside of the cell, inside, is slightly negative. The inside of the cell is slightly negative compared to the outside of the cell. That's really, really important because in the next unit, we're going to get into talking about, um, you know, uh, ATP formation. And the next semester, we're going to talk about muscle contraction. And we will talk about nerve transmission. And in order to have an action potential for these two things, we have to have sodium flood back into the cell. Because some of you are probably wondering, well, if this keeps happening, don't we ever get rid of all the sodium that's on the inside of the cell? Well, if you remember, we also have some not carrier proteins. We have channel proteins that are in the membrane. And some of these channel proteins have an affinity for sodium and they will allow sodium to come through passively from a high to a low concentration whenever need be. Okay, well the time that that happens is when we go through an action potential during nerve transmission or muscle contraction, a bunch of sodium would flood into the cell and supply the sodium that's needed to be able to actively be pumped out through active transport. Okay, so it's really important that we have this steep gradient because that's how animal cells work when it comes to muscle contraction and nerve transmission. We have to have this steep gradient across the cell membrane. Okay, so it's maintained by pumping three sodiums out for two potassiums in, but then the way we reestablish that is by facilitated diffusion, passive transport. Some of these channel proteins will allow sodium to go back in, and there's also some that will allow potassium to go back out. So we have both passive transport working with active transport to maintain the steep gradient. Okay? So there's one other thing I want to write here. Um, you're probably going to have to, I have, need a new sheet, so I'm going to write it here. I'm going to put a star right here, a little star. <coughs> my little Moby, my great new Moby is messing up. Okay, so I wanted to write the sodium and potassium pump is also referred to as an electrogenic pump, okay, electrogenic pump, electrogenic pump, because it establishes, establishes a negative charge, establishes a negative charge inside the cell relative to the outside, and that's due to the three NAs being pumped out for the two potassiums being pumped in. So we also refer to it as an electrogenic pump. It is the most important electrogenic pump in animals and animal cells because this is how our, like I said, our nerve cells and our cardiac muscle cells, etc., cetera, um, work. Okay, so the second picture shows the proton pump, which works in a similar fashion, only you notice there's not sodium and potassium. We actually have hydrogen ions. Okay, so it's very similar to the sodium potassium pump. This one is the major, put a star here, it's the major electrogenic pump for plants, fungi, 
in bacteria, this is their primary electrogenic pump, whereas in animals, the primary one is the sodium potassium pump, but it works in the same way. You'll notice that this is a proton pump. It's pumping hydrogen from a low to a high concentration, okay, from the cytosol out to the extracellular fluid, and that also creates a change in charge. If you're pumping a bunch of positives out, that makes the inside slightly negative compared to the outside. Okay, now if you're wondering, well, how does hydrogen ever get pumped in? Once again, there are some of these that will be channels that through facilitated diffusion will allow some hydrogens to come back through the other way when need be in order to maintain this gradient. Okay, so I want to make sure I mention that. Okay, so um, last example basically is bulk transport. We need to go over um, the bulk transport of things into and out of the cell. So this one I like to call bulk, B-U-L-K, bulk transport. Because this is not using proteins, this is actually using vesicles. Okay, this is using vesicles to get things into and out of the cell. Okay, so the first thing is you'll notice exo. Exo means exit. Okay, exit the cell. Then we have cyto, which refers to cell. So this is to get things out of the cell. It's how we secrete biomolecules, um, stuff that we want to spit out like insulin, hormones, here's more examples, hormones, neurotransmitters, proteins that were made at the rough ER that went to the Golgi that needed to be spit out of the cell. So the way that we get those out, as you can see in this picture right here, this is a vesicle. And remember, the vesicles are pinches of other organelles. So maybe this came from, let's just make it up and say it came from the Golgi. And it's carrying protein molecules that are coming from the Golgi that need to be shipped out away from the cell. So this vesicle right here, that's the vesicle, V-E-S-I-C-L-E, -E, was a pinching of the Golgi apparatus. It comes up. Notice how it joins with the cell membrane. You can see how it joins right here. Okay, so here's your vesicle coming like this. It joins with it, makes the phospholipid bilayer, spits the contents out, okay, then this joins in with the cell membrane. Now, if you're wondering, well, does that make the cell grow larger every time this happens? No, because in a second we're going to look at endocytosis, which is the opposite, bringing things into the cell, which will pinch into this. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure that you knew that this was spitting out, okay, this could be getting rid of insulin, proteins, or transmitters, hormones, um, and plants, this is actually, uh, plants will break off pieces of their cell wall, put that into vesicles in order to build new cells, okay? All right, next one is the opposite, which is endocytosis. So instead of exo, endo means to enter the cell. It's also nicknamed, which is, this is kind of crude, but it's called sucking in, but it's when things are entering the cell, not through a protein channel, protein pump, instead, they're going to join with the cell membrane, bind, and pinch off into a vesicle on the inside of the cell. Okay, so this is joining with the cell membrane. This could be um, a piece of something. It might be a protein. It could be a food particle. It could be a droplet of a fluid, let's say an oil. It might be, uh, let's say, a bacteria or a virus if your white blood cell was going to attack it. Um, if it was a single-celled organism, like if it was an amoeba that lived in a pond, this is their primary way of eating. They would bring something into their little single-celled body through endocytosis, and it would pinch off in a vesicle inside their little body. Okay, so you'll notice there's three examples underneath this. It's kind of like three breaking off, three mini sections of endocytosis. The first one is called phago because to phage, a phage means to eat. So phagocytosis is sucking in and it's a food particle. It's a solid particle. Whereas pinocytosis is sucking in, but it's a fluid droplet, like some kind of oil or fluid droplet that is put into a vesicle. Receptor mediated is like the first two, only it is very specific. Um, one specific example in our body is for cholesterol. Cholesterol is an example of receptor-mediated endocytosis where we take in uh, cholesterol molecules into the cell because there are specific receptors, that's what the word receptor means, that binds to it and takes it in. 
The first two are kind of generic. It could be any solid particle or any fluid droplet that would come into the cell, um, and they would just come in with a piece of the cell membrane, whereas receptor-mediated is going to use receptor proteins. So if you look at the three pictures right here, here's phagocytosis. So this is a solid piece. Okay, so in this picture, this is like a food particle, something coming into the cell. Maybe this is an amoeba. Okay, this would be a perfect example of an amoeba eating. If this amoeba has a food particle coming in, the cell membrane, you can see, pinches in, okay, so it like dips in. The food comes in, and now the piece of the cell membrane forms this vesicle. So that's a phospholipid bilayer around the food particle. This can then go join, let's say, with a lysosome, and the lysosome can release the enzymes to chop this up so that the amoeba would be able to eat. We would also do this, by the way, in our white blood cells. Your white blood cells, are the job is to fight infection, so we could take in a bacteria or a virus like this in the white blood cell comes in, would also join up with the lysosome and then chew up that bacteria or virus and kill it and get rid of it. The second picture is penocytosis, same exact process. The only difference is this would be taking in um, different sorts of liquids, okay, so liquids, and we could also get some ions that could come in like this. You can see these triangular particles that would come in with the liquid material, but they're coming in in a vesicle, not through a receptor protein um, or, excuse me, a channel protein or a, um, a pump. They're not coming in like that. They're coming in in a vesicle. So there's your vesicle, brings it in, and brings it to the location that it needs to go. Okay, the third picture, receptor mediated, same process. Okay, you've got this little vesicle, but the difference is, look at the little Ys. These are specific receptors. Okay, they are receptors that are on the cell membrane, and they are built to fit a certain molecule. So in this case, they're fitting the purple molecule. So the purple molecule can bind to that. This forms what we call a coated pit. The coated pit is the name of the vesicle because it's got coated proteins around the outside. See all the purple things? They're special proteins. It's coated. Okay, the ligand is what we call the substance that's binding to the receptor. So this could be cholesterol in our body. It binds to that, to that um, receptor protein. It comes in in a vesicle, and now it's in a coated vesicle that goes into the, the cell. Does that make sense? Okay, the last thing I wanted to mention, and then we are done with this video, um, I'm going to actually erase this and make a clean template here. The last thing I wanted to mention in the um, receptor-mediated endocytosis, okay, in this one, I did want to mention that um, for us, you know, you might go, well, why would we need cholesterol? Cholesterol would need to get into our cells. Um, let's say we needed to make more cell membrane. If we're going through cell division, we need to make more cell membrane. Or in order for us to make certain steroids, like hormones, etc. Well, cholesterol normally travels in the bloodstream, and it's attached to particles called LDLs. You may have heard of this if, you're, if you've ever had your blood taken or your parents have had their blood taken. So cholesterol travels with these LDLs. Okay, they're called low-density lipoproteins. It's basically lipid and protein material. So these LDLs bind to the LDL receptors on the cell membrane. Okay, so these would be like LDL receptors, and the LDLs bind to that. And that will allow the cholesterol, because cholesterol is sticking to that, that would allow cholesterol to get into the cell and be used. Well, some people have what is called familial hypercholesterolemia. It's a very big word, but it's hyper cholesterolemia. Okay, hypercholesterolemia. Well, if you look at the word high cholesterol, it's genetically linked. It's uh, familial. It's an inherited disease where people have a very high level of cholesterol in the blood. Okay, maybe one of your parents has this where they take medication for high cholesterol. The problem involves this receptor-mediated endocytosis. Basically, there are LDLs that are in the bloodstream that have cholesterol attached to them. They cannot enter the cell through receptor-mediated endocytosis because their receptor proteins are defective or missing. So these red receptor proteins are either defective or they're missing altogether. So that makes the LDLs with the cholesterol stay in the bloodstream. They stay out here. And then that is where you get high cholesterol. It can accumulate in the blood, and it can lead to diseases called atherosclerosis, which is um, hardening of the arteries. It's where the plaques build up on the inside of the arteries. 
which can cause like heart attacks or um, you know uh, diseases, strokes, stuff like that. It can cause like a, a lot of problems to a person. Okay. All right. I believe that is it on passive. I mean, excuse me, on active transport. That's just the other picture. Just made it bigger. We can see what's going on. And we are done with this video.